I'm Lauren McLean, and welcome to Mentoring Nature Connections. I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge the traditional territories we each find ourselves on today. For me, I live on Heritage Mountain in Port Moody, British Columbia. I overlook the Burrard Inlet, which is a coastal fjord beginning at the Strait of Georgia and the Pacific Ocean. This is the land of the Kwikwitlam First Nations. This episode is going to explore how nature and outdoor learning can support and nurture social emotional learning. I love this quote from Rishab Gautam, waterfalls wouldn't sound so melodious if there were no rocks in their way. The meaning I take from this is that we don't need to be scared of rocks, but we need to be aware of the rocks along our path, the impacts they can have on our journey, and we need to have strategies to overcome the challenges that rocks can pose for us. So, to help us learn about all the possibilities of social emotional learning in nature, we have Miriam Miller here, joining us by Zoom. She is a learner, teacher educator, researcher, and outdoor enthusiast, committed to working alongside educators to embed social and emotional learning, SEL, and emotional well-being into their practice. Miriam is a senior coach and trainer with the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale University and a researcher with the Social, Emotional, and Educational Development Lab at the University of British Columbia. Miriam also has a family history with a connection between literacy and the outdoors. Her great-great-great-grandparent, Catherine Parr Trail, wrote several books about the backwoods of Canada. Thanks so much for joining us today, Miriam. How are you doing? I'm well, Lauren. It's so good to be here and to be able to speak with you and share some ideas together. Thanks, me too. So let's dig in and start talking about what SEL is and how it fits into our curriculum in British Columbia. So social and emotional learning is a process of acquiring and and developing skills and competencies across our lifespan. And these skills and competencies are often um, quoted to be related to success, but really that is a term that maybe we don't need to use in this definition. And so our skills and competencies are related to um, individual competencies, like emotional awareness, emotion management, um, having a growth mindset, understanding who we are and having a positive identity, a positive personal and cultural identity, but also they are interpersonal skills. So, um, having social awareness, having empathy, being able to negotiate and problem solve and manage conflict with others, having uh, strong positive relationships, and so on. So it's a, a host of skills and competencies that we need to navigate life and our relationships in order to really get the most out of our lives. I like how you're highlighting the why of SEL and how focusing on those skills will help us in the long term. I'm also wondering how CASEL fits under the umbrella of SEL. So the most common definition of social and emotional learning comes from CASEL, which is a collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning. Um, Folks can check out CASEL.org to find more resources. And CASEL conceptualizes SEL as having five main clusters of competencies. So self-awareness and self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. And um, CASEL essentially reviews and recommends programs, SEL programs, that can be picked up and adopted into classroom practice. Thanks, that's a great description of CASEL. Now, as I understand it, SEL isn't just about implementing a program into your classroom, is that correct? Social and emotional learning has many different ways that we can bring this work into our classrooms and into our contexts. And I think quite often we um, look for explicit lessons around different topics related to SEL. And whether we use a program or not, we might explicitly teach about peaceful conflict resolution. But in addition to explicit instruction, as educators, we we need to remember we are always modeling these skills. So there's implicit instruction uh, of what we what we show our students and, and what we model to our students. In addition to that implicit instruction of modeling, we also have instruction that happens through the routines and practices we take up in our classroom. 
And for me, I feel like this is where SEL becomes very powerful. We don't just want to teach explicitly these skills to our students. We want our students to have opportunities to practice and apply them in real and meaningful ways. And this is where I find outdoor learning is an enormous opportunity for both educators and our learners to come together and practice and apply the skills of negotiating social relationships, of attentive listening, of um, quiet awareness of themselves and what it means to be surrounded by, by different sounds and different experiences. So outdoors becomes a provocation or a place where we can practice our social and emotional skills. Well, and now that you've mentioned using the outdoors as an extension of the classroom to practice social and emotional skills, do you have any tips and tricks for how educators can implement skills into their outdoor learning time? So I might first say, um, when we think about integrating opportunities for SEL out, outdoors, and if we think about doing this with intentionality, because lots of this will happen just naturally and intuitively, but I think the first thing I would share is just the idea of routines. And I know, Lauren, you often share about these routines, nature routines of a gathering place and of having something that brings folks, your, your class together, like a wolf howl or, you know, these different sounds. And I think that these routines help to provide structure and safety, consistency, consistency for our students um, that sometimes feels like it goes, no pun intended, out, out the door when we go out the door. And so I think we want to continue to establish those routines so students feel safe, so they feel like they have an idea of what to expect, even though so much is still unexpected when we're outside. Relatedly, when we think about mindfulness outdoors, I think the outdoors provide such a rich atmosphere for ourselves and for our students to slow down, to slow down, to pause, and to attend to their environment. Um, many years ago, I took a, a class um, on Indigenous research and methodology, and one of our classes, we went down to the beach, and we were invited to learn from the land, learn from and with the land. And I was a little skeptical of like, well, what am I supposed to learn? And what am I supposed to do? And what do I need to come back with? And what answer do I need to have? And the invitation was simply to listen and to listen until you felt you heard what you needed. And when I first sat down on this log to look at the landscape and the, the, you know, the waves in front of me, my mind was racing. And I kept thinking like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And eventually I settled and I started to listen to the patterns and the rhythms around me and to notice what it felt like in my body just to be still and to be present. And then I, I heard my own thoughts that had slowed. And it was really quite a moving experience. And I'm not suggesting, you know, educators go and take their kids to the beach and spend an hour while they just sit and listen. Um, but I think we can have these momentary opportunities where we invite children to have a sit spot, to sit, to notice what is the sounds around them, the feelings of their, maybe their legs pressing up against the grass or wherever they might be, whether it's urban, rural, suburban, it doesn't matter, but just to be outside, to notice the air coming into our lungs and to attend to the things that sometimes we overlook in the classroom. So this is such a beautiful mindful practice of mindful listening, maybe mindful observation. So not just in a sit spot, but touching the different textures. Oh my goodness, I feel like I could talk for hours. But really when we think about these different textures and mindful, mindful feeling and sensing, you know, inside in many schools we have sensory walks, right? But we don't need these sensory walks outside because they just exist naturally. And so often we bring things, we create artificial experiences for kids within the walls of our school that we can access in a natural way outside, like mindful touching, mindful feeling maybe we'll call it, mindful senses, listening, touching, smelling, 
breathing feeling. Oh, Miriam, I love that. And it reminds me of the familiarity of a place. The more we visit it, the stronger our relationship becomes with it. I love the idea of of becoming familiar with a place. And I think, again, this is an opportunity to practice, apply, and deepen social and emotional skills. Because we often talk about relationships when we think about SEL. And when we speak of relationships, we're typically speaking about human relationships. But I think that outdoors invites us to expand our understanding of relationships to consider what does it mean to be in relation with the land, with a place, with the inhabitants, human and non-human, of that place. And just like a, a human relationship, Human relationships grow as we become familiar, as we become comfortable, as we engage in in different situations over time. It's not a one-time experience, and we don't get together with a human in the same way every time. And that holds true when we're outside, when we are learning in and from a place. We can experience what it means to be familiar and to build a relation with a relationship with that place. Now, tied into this concept of developing relationships with the land, I'd like to ask you about programs like the SEED framework, which stands for Social, Emotional, and Environmental Education Development Framework. It's a nature-based, social-emotional approach for early childhood education. Now, it's not exactly an intervention program, but it's to support and encourage um, caring learning environments. So in a way, they're trying to create this balance between child development in terms of social and emotional competencies and environmental sustainability. That's great. Yeah, so I love the idea of um, a framework that supports our learning and that can help kind of guide us in the way that we think or rethink what outdoor learning means, especially in relation to SEL. Um, and I, I, as I think about my own understanding that's changed over time about relationships and being in relation to the land, I think that the idea of reciprocity comes up here, right? Where we can acknowledge, recognize, be grateful. So having mindful attention acknowledging the gifts that a place brings that nature provides for us and having that gratitude, which is something we want um, through SEL and even doing some perspective taking and empathy building around a place or the land and thinking of reciprocity as what does the land provide for us? What can we give back? And not just in a transactional economic exchange of like the land gives us this and we give it this back, but it, this, kind of exploration of reciprocity, I think, and relationship, um, what it means to be in relationship, I think pushes us to start to think about stewardship, certainly, um, about care, um, care of a place and and what it means. But it also invites more than just um, just this transaction. It invites us to really think about how we are part of the very thing that we are in relationship with, right? And so what does that mean to be a part of something much bigger than ourselves? And how do we navigate that? Now, I think that's actually a good segue into asking you about engagement and how nature provides different forms of engagement and joy. I'm wondering how this has an impact on our learners. We know so much about the research that our brains work better when we have joyful experiences. And I think with outdoor learning, we invite children and adults to play and to be joyful. And I'm not suggesting that outdoor learning equals play, and which equals SEL and end of story, but you know, Often when we bring students outside, for the first few minutes, there's sort of a playful exploration um, and a playful engagement. And even when we move into more focused learning, whether that's, you know, in observing patterns and, and rhythms in nature that's related to your, the numeracy that you're exploring, this still has um, joyful elements to it. 
sometimes our work in classrooms becomes so scripted. And part of our hope for children is that they can respond to things as they unfold in ways that are unexpected. And being in nature provides a sort of natural um, opportunity to safely explore unexpected discoveries, unexpected um, relationships between cause and effect of what happens when this when, when I do this. And so I think there's such a great chance here for students to safely explore and play in ways that a classroom doesn't always provide the same opportunities. This reminds me of our last episode when I was chatting with Shelley Moore about inclusive education and how we react when we are met with unexpected situations. We don't want to mask our frustration or hide it under the covers. It's okay to feel disappointment when we wanted to go outside to jump in puddles, for example. But now that we are outside with our learners and we realize, uh uh-oh, the puddles have now all evaporated. So could you speak to this idea of nature and unpredictability? We know that learning is full of emotions, that any learning situation is saturated with emotional experience. And this holds true in any space especially outside, where, um, as, we, as we shared, there's some unpredictable aspects of being outdoors. And so while we hold in one hand the idea of emotional safety, right? So we've got some routines. We have a safe and caring uh, relationship with our students. And we, we, bring, we don't leave that in, inside in our classroom, but we bring it with us in any learning situation. And so within this kind of container of emotional safety, we also know that sometimes things go differently than planned in any situation. But sometimes when you're outside, you might find uh, a, a dead bird, right? Or, well, let's just say a dead bird. And this can be incredibly moving for students right, where they are confronted with loss, and they are confronted with loss that is not imaginary. It is true to them. In this moment, there is authentic curiosity, authentic grief, authentic disappointment. And here we have an opportunity as educators to experience emotionality with our students. Because we often talk about it, And we might read a story about these different emotions, but we often don't share in a common experience. And so outdoors provides us with a safe way to engage in in felt emotional experiences that we share quite often as a collective, right? That little group that discovered the bird, they have something and they've experienced something and now they're sharing and we're all looking. And now here we can learn about life cycles, but we can also learn about the emotions that follow life cycles of hope and loss and grief and despair and, and, and like what's next for our group. And so, I mean, that sounds like a very grave, well, that's also not a pun, but it's a very serious <laughs> example, but it, it could be as simple, Lauren, as you had talked about before of, you know, wanting to go splash in puddles and the puddles have evaporated and that's, maybe frustrating for some kids or disappointing for others. And so we can name our emotional experiences and build an emotional literacy and vocabulary while we model regulation and co-regulation of what does it mean to feel disappointed? And like, it's okay to feel disappointed. It happens because there are things that happen outside of our control. And, And again, there's a bit of a collective experience there that we can process and work through this together. And it's not about, okay, puddles dried up, we're disappointed, okay, what's next? It doesn't have to be like that at all. It can be, oh man, like the puddles dried up. Like that was the whole reason we were coming out to do these experiments with water and splashing and this kind of thing. And and it's okay to kind of sit with that and share that I'm disappointed too. And actually, I'm not sure what we should do now. Right? And now then you problem solve. You share the goal and you can explore what's next. So I think outdoors just provides um, 
like any learning, a rich emotional landscape. And what's different about outdoors is that maybe we feel a bit more space to pause and to explore those emotions in the context of the place. Thank you for that. Now, I was just chatting to a friend earlier today about universal design and how if something is going to benefit one student, most likely it's going to benefit all our students. So let's think competency-based and strength-based first. In which case, if using the outdoors to help develop SEL in kids with social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties, then why don't we plan for outdoor learning with all our students, not just the students that have been singled out? So I often get called to work with schools um, around particular uh, topics related to social and emotional learning. And sometimes I get asked questions about like, okay, Miriam, these skills are great, but you know, like there are one or two students that I really need to target. And so what would you recommend for these students who you know, are struggling with emotion processing or self-regulation or interpersonal relationships? And I always struggle with the response. And in part, my struggle is that SEL is designed as a universal skills promotion. So it's not um, designed as a secondary or tertiary intervention necessarily. In fact, we, we don't really consider it as an intervention. But we want to think about healthy skills promotion um, and development. Uh, and so this approach is, it takes, is like the rising, what is it? The rising tide lifts all ships, right? And so the idea, which you know, is in parallel with universal design for learning, is that we can design knowing that um, we want to support skill development, but this is, this is helpful for all children. And so in this way, sometimes when I get called to schools who ask about self-regulation, and we just want strategies for self-regulation, which is a valid question, uh, but we want, also want to remember that this is relational and we're humans. And so some strategies for some aren't going to work for everyone. So we want to be, you know, mindfully trying a number of different things. But some of the recommendations I always have are, are play and going outside. I don't know about the folks who are listening, but I know when I am having a rough day and I am cranky and my you know, emotional resources are depleted and I'm just struggling to regulate. I'm like quick to snap. And maybe my own child is feeling in a similar way. When we go outside, this sort of eventually melts away and we aren't as cranky. Like nature can regulate us. And so in the same way, when we're thinking about strategies for some students, for all students, we want to think about how is nature a process that also regulates and supports our students so that when we, when we do engage outdoors, we can know that this will benefit everyone. I think the other part is that not all our time outdoors has to be structured time. And play can be and should be provided for our older learners as well. Yeah, and I think when we, when we consider routines, both for emotional safety and physical safety, of course we want, you know, we want to move outside and maybe you, ha- you start in your meeting place and you do a quick check-in and then you let kids play, like that output where when we move into a space that isn't as um, restrictive, when there's suddenly no ceiling above us, we often want to move our bodies and, and make noises to fill the space. And if we neglect that opportunity for kids and we ask them to come to the the meeting place and sit down right away and let's do a mindful listening, the amount of regulation that has to happen in order to pause is so enormous. It's like impossible. And so we want to start, I think we often want to start our experiences outside with a bit of like joyful output, joyful exploration, make your noises, run around, do your things. And allow that like physiological energy to be regulated. And then you have your your sound that brings everyone back, your warning to let them know, you know, one more minute and then they come back. And now, whew, whew, I can kind of shake it out 
and I'm able to sit and listen or, or be present to whatever instructions are coming next about the, the, the learning, if there's a particular learning focus. So we want our time outside to be um, structured and consistent, but not so structured that we don't have opportunities for play and exploration. At the same time, we don't only want to go outside just to run around and play because we have intentional learning that can happen when we plan our time outside. I love that point that you made about how we need to fill the space. So starting with routines that foster both physical and emotional safety, as you mentioned, and respecting that need that we need to release our energies at first. So I think this is a time where I'd like to connect that idea of play and joyful explorations with a quote that I read earlier this week, which says, at the end of the day, the only questions I will ask myself are, did I love enough? Did I laugh enough? And did I make a difference? That's such a beautiful quote. When we think about um, play and joyful exploration, I really want to push the idea that we hold true in SEL that social and emotional learning is first for the educators that are bringing the work into their learning spaces. And in the same way, these ideas apply to us as educators of play and exploration outside. And so this isn't just about providing our students with opportunities for joyful, playful, rich learning outdoor um, experiences. It's also for us. And like, how joyful is it to play hide and seek with your kids. It's just hilarious, right? And when do we laugh and and love and feel that vibrancy of just being together and doing something fun or noticing some incredible spiral pattern as you are exploring leaves or, or ferns on your play in your play area, right? There's just so much that we can do and, and experience together. Miriam, I love how poetically you can speak about the importance of us playing with our learners. I find myself being able to daydream as you speak. It's so lovely. Uh, Sadly, our time is coming to an end. So I'd like to ask you one final question about if you have a novelty nature note that you'd like to share with us today. It's basically just a fun, random nature fact. And mine today is about cougars because we've been having a lot of problems with these cats up in my neck of the woods on Heritage Mountain. So not only are they the second largest cat in North America, but they are unable to roar. They have the biggest range of animals in the Western Hemisphere, and they can actually jump up to 20 feet in the air. There are so many random nature facts that I think that we could share. Um, But I would say I would choose something that comes from my experiences being in and on water. I just love being on the shore, being at the beach. And as a young child growing up on Vancouver Island, um, my, my folks were very innovative with how to keep their six children occupied on the beach. And so my dad taught me that you know it's safe to open your eyes in salt water which i did when i would swim all the time and he taught me that if you find bull kelp which we would find you can bite off the bottom of the bite a hole in the i don't know the bulb of the bull kelp and cut the top just break it off and you can use it as a natural snorkel And so we would spend hours kicking around in different tide pools and on the shore snorkeling with bull kelp. Oh, I remember doing that as a kid too. That's so lovely. Miriam, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us today. It is my pleasure. And this brings my passions together of of being outside and of social and emotional learning and development. And I love exploring these and, and sharing ideas related to this. So thank you, Lauren. Anytime, truly. Now, if you would like to find out more information about Miriam Miller, you can follow her on Twitter at Miriam underscore E underscore Miller. I will also post the more detailed information that we covered today under the podcast notes. If you have any questions for myself, or if you're interested in learning more about taking your learners outdoors, please visit mentoringnatureconnections.wordpress.com and feel free to contact me about a variety of workshops and other outdoor consulting opportunities. 
Now until next time, go and get your hands dirty and have fun with Mentoring Nature Connections. <laughs>